the original word is like a Mobius strip. It's, it's a singular surface, essentially, a singular infinite surface and a singular side. Um, so you can continue on a Mobius strip forever, uh, like you'll, you'll go back to its original meeting point. So essentially, there's only one surface. So if you take a piece of paper, for example, and you just loop the two ends together, you have an inside and an outside surface. So maybe a strip is where you put a twist in, like a half twist in, and then you join it, and then you essentially only create one side. So if you were to draw a line, you'd go all the way back to that same line without ever having to flip the paper. So I created these structures because A, I got really tired of um, having this long piece of paper and I was working with scrolls a lot um, and my work is actually very much influenced by Chinese landscape practices and, um, and Chinese landscape painting. So I was working a lot with um, scroll formats and with traditional Chinese scrolls and playing with the space in those scrolls. And then when I started working in situ outside, um, the paper was all sort of like in one long form, but it was, it was very difficult to, to um, control in the wind. So that's why I, I thought of a loop. When I was drawing, especially when I was responding to sound, and sometimes I'll draw with two hands, so I'll hold a pencil or a pen in each hand, and I'll be responding to sounds on either side of me. And if it was a finite surface with distinct square edges, or like say straight edges on a rectangle, I'd start composing visually, and, um, and I wanted something that was infinite. And if, if it was just a, a rectangle, I'd have to flip it over to do the other side, because otherwise it would just be a, a flat visual graphic surface. So that's why I, came, I thought of the Mobius strip. And it was actually partly influenced by, um, she's a philosopher called Elizabeth Gross, and she talked about, she used the Mobius strip as an analogy for um, bodies and the way that our bodies relate to physical environments, how there is no distinct um, separation between inner and outer, um, that it's a continuous sort of flow. And then that made me think about the idea of the Mobius strip as a way of disrupting the visual surface, the visual graphic surface, and of enabling me to work on a drawing surface that was more empathetic to the softness of my body and the mobility of my body. And I speak of these structures as paper mediators. It took me a long time to think about what to call them because they weren't sculptures. They weren't these objects that I had created with a finite form in mind, but rather the form evolves through a process of interaction with all of the contingencies of places. So whether it be the wind, um, sometimes it would be obviously the rain and the paper forms themselves, they would change in texture and weight and responsiveness depending upon the humidity. Um, the paper that I use, uh, which is available uh, at art stores around Sydney, um, they're, they're traditional Chinese papers um, that are quite fragile when they're wet, but they're fairly strong um, when they're dry. And what I do with them um, for this particular set of works, I had actually strengthened them slightly um, by applying a, a medium. So it's actually like a, it's actually an ink medium. And, um, and it kind of, it gives it a little, a little bit more strength, but it, I use a very watered down medium actually. Um, and I, I do, I connect um, the paper together as well using a traditional glue that I actually cook from wheat starch. So it's a wheat starch based glue. Uh, and also actually in, in the other pieces, um, I always use this type of glue um, to wet mount two or three pieces of paper together. And, and that will make it really like much stronger. And what the wheat starch based glue also does is it gives the paper a memory. Um, so it allows the paper to hold memories of the shapes of my body um, that are formed by the wind or by 
by the Australian sun. I found that the Australian sun is quite distinct. It dries paper really quickly. The actual process of this new body of works, um, the fluvial dynamics, um, maybe as scrolls, uh, I was actually really wanting to think about how an, an aspect of nature, I had worked with wind and I was curious about rain. I was wanting to see how marks could be activated by nature. So I, I focused on rain because I was interested in cycles of water and I was thinking about uh, what mediums I could use that were actually responsive to water. So hence the water soluble charcoal and also the, the ink pens that I was using that when it rains while I'm drawing, it diffuses the paper, uh, diffuses the ink. And um, I thought about stitching with thread that had been imbued with water soluble charcoal and that had been imbued with um, these water soluble inks. So um, with the, the Mobius scrolls where I used a stitching process, I would actually get lengths of um, uh, thread and I use a water soluble charcoal um, that's also re readily available at art stores um, and I run the charcoal along the cotton thread. So it actually sort of becomes like, it literally goes from white to black. You know, I just cover it with this charcoal. Uh, yes, so, so covering the thread um, with charcoal and then um, using that thread to um, stitch through the paper. And, um, and the other p um, process that I also used was um, using the water soluble ink pens I unfortunately couldn't find water soluble bottled ink, which would have been a lot easier. I could have dipped it in, um, but I actually used the pen to draw, um, to like draw along um, the, the cotton thread. It was like a, thankfully it was like a, a, a brush pen. So I was able to actually um, get a, have a wider surface area. And then um, I, would, I would stitch that. One thing that I find that making these pieces really, um, really allows me to do, or, or rather what it encourages me to do. It encourages me to really stay still in a place. And it is such a rare thing that any of us really do. Um, so when I was there, yes, I was looking at the forecasts, hoping for rain, checking it for rain, looking at the rain radar. <laughs> but that rain doesn't always come. You know, it might say, you know, 50% chance of rain, but you might be in that spot of Sydney where it doesn't hit you. <laughs> so I'll be sitting outside um, or walking outside as well along um, the walking tracks, holding these pieces of paper, anticipating that first raindrop and also at the same time, that anticipation, that time of waiting is, is an enforced time also of expanding my awareness to what's around me. So I'm there, I'm sitting on the rocks and, um, or I'm walking along and I'm listening to the cicadas and the birds. Um, and it's a, it's a time, it's a space where that having that object in your arms it's almost like it's almost like i guess how perhaps some people use rosaries or sometimes people might use um like prayer beads it's a, a it's a focal point having the work in my arms is almost like this focal point i feel like i'm holding that experience of listening or that focus of listening and at the same time that point of focus is also a point from which there is an expansion of listening and an expansion of my sense of self to what is around me. So I found, I found it extremely, um, again, I, I would say it was extremely restorative, just being forced to sit. So that, that process of, um, I guess it would be a kind of a deep listening and a, a deep awareness of what's happening around me um, is I have to say, probably one of the most enjoyable parts of, and one of the privileges of making these works. As you'll see all of these lines where the pigment settles into creases um, in the paper, 
And, um, and that is entirely determined by the kind of rain that's there at that time. For another one of the pieces, um, the fluvial dynamics um, rain and tidal pools that I made on Middle Harbour, where the, the, um, the lines of stitching are more meandering and um, more loose and intuitive. With that rain, that was where I waited for over two hours. <laughs> and, and there was like occasional sort of like drops of rain. I would get um, on the parts using what the ink, um, they would dis dis like sort of release into these sort of like some parts that are concentrated, some parts that are diffuse. And then later that evening, when there was more of a downpour, I, I ran outside <laughs> with it and I was holding it in the rain. And because it was a strong rain and there was a downpour, I was able to have it catch the water quite suddenly have, and it would release the ink and I take it inside and, um, and then because it would dry more quickly than when I was sort of walking for hours with it all damp and scrunchable, um, this one, I could let it sort of dry and spread it out. The actual inks uh, did not, and the charcoal did not diffuse as much, so you, more of the paper would remain white, so you'd get a greater contrast. So when I'm creating the sound feedback um, drawing compositions and I'm encountering, um, I guess, curved rocks, I've done it um, in, inside a mining tunnel before as well. And um, I've done it in between um, spaces of rocks. I've done it in stairwells. Often that process is, um, is quite intuitive and it's a process of listening. So I initially developed it in order to enable me to listen to the, um, the resonance of spaces and the resonance of material as well. So um, when I set up the speakers, there is a lot of testing involved and a lot of, I guess, large and small arm movements and body movements. And I have to be fairly close to the ground and close to the speakers. Um, and I have to find sweet spots. And these sweet spots kind of change as well, which is really interesting. Um, so I'm constantly having to move back and forth and kind of negotiating with the sounds. And um, all of the ambient sounds around me, so, um, sounds of cicadas were quite incredible. Um, the sounds of birds, um, uh, I guess air traffic noise as well. Um, they all sort of feed the speakers, uh, sort of feed the microphones and they come out of the speakers. And depending on, I guess, I feel like it changes depending on the pitch as well. Um, so it changed the time, the timing also changes. So sometimes I have to be there right at the right time. Um, so it's a very intuitive bodily response um, to the shapes and also to the materials. So like I tried it in the car park <laughs> just opposite the studios. And because it's flat concrete and it's an open space, all I got was like a deep kind of hum. But if I'm in a space that has beautiful curves um, in the rocks, I get all of this variations of like high pitched sort of shimmers and these really deep hums as well. With the sonic ink vibration pieces, I use a technique called suminagashi, which is a traditional Japanese marbling technique. I have to use um, traditional inks that I've ground for, it, it takes me hours to actually grind it. Um, so that the actual binding medium and it's um, within that ink is strong enough to withstand the sound vibrations. I've been drawn towards uh, Chinese and Japanese ink practices since my undergraduate studies um, at uni. So I'd say since at least 2005, 2006 and um, I'm I've never fully understood understood why, but there's there's something about the the way that space is understood in um, 
in Chinese landscape, Chinese Japanese landscape, and also in calligraphy practices. That is very different to, um, I guess, the the ways of perspectival drawing that I had been trained in at art school here. So I still feel that I have not mastered that understanding of that kind of space um, that you see in um, traditional landscape paintings and in calligraphy practice because I've never actually trained in those um, particular traditions. I've always been fully self-taught. and um, But I would look at I love artists like um, Hasegawa Tohaku, like Seshu, um, and Chinese painters like Nisan, um, and Song Dynasty painters as well. And um, they absolutely inform um, the way that I work, and also the brush, the way that the brush actually has a breath that expires, where the ink actually fades as you draw. Um, where there's this, there's a very, a huge difference in the interaction between the brush tip and the surface of paper that, um, that is very, it's, it's very different to the feeling of friction that you get from a pencil on paper. So, and the brush is able to express um, different marks that are like soft and washy and diffuse through to um, these dry, they call them like flying white, where like a, like a brush stroke will reveal, um, oh, that is quite dry, we'll have all these like white spaces in between the black. So all of these um, traditions, I think that they are always inherent within me, even though strangely, and, and I, I never really have to try, um, but all of my works, they will always have a distinctly, I guess, East Asian appearance, not even though I don't necessarily um, uh, consciously try to make that so, but I feel like it is just, it's just within me. But then at the same time, when I look at some of my visual compositions um, of works that are more, I guess, um, graphically orientated, or, or sorry, visually um, uh, composed, uh, they they are still very much um, also <laughs> um, very much um, reflective of I guess my more Western educational training <laughs> that has um, come through from my art, um, um, learning and training in art school here. So the video works really evolved um, out of a. I guess a small challenge to myself of how to articulate visually my experience of listening within a place. So I work with um, just my handheld, like just my phone camera that I put onto like a 4K setting. So I have like an extra, like extra resolution, resolution, <laughs> extra large, yes. So. Um, I, I actually hold it using like a small gorilla pod and I don't use any, um, I don't use a gimbal, I don't use any kind of um, uh, like steadying um, uh, software or anything. So you can see it's, you know, there's this unstable kind of shifting that occurs and all of that is done so that I may, it's able to reflect my bo bodily experience of crouching close to the ground, which is generally how I actually record my sounds. So I like to record quite close to the ground because the ground itself actually um, creates almost like a um, like sound reflector <laughs> on its own. So that experience of listening close to the ground um, by the river was something that I wanted to convey um, visually. and and. It evolved into um, a, a really interesting visual um, uh, experience because I noticed places I had never actually thought about just how incredible the light on water was. And there were places where like underneath the O'Connell Street overpass, the architectural features on, of these um, beams under, underneath this bridge created the most amazing patterns on the surface of the water. And these patterns would change depending on the time of day, whether or not the birds swam um, past, 
um, whether the wind was blowing in a particular direction and whether the, the um, actual flow of the river um, was being like, affected by then the surface winds that were occurring. So the actual process um, emerged from an attempt to work outside um, with the rain um, and an attempt to actually um, uh, use water that had um, fallen on the rocks um, overnight from overnight rain and um, you know, pressing uh, plain paper onto those rocks to get the, the, um, the patterns of water and then applying ink to them. But while I was working outside, um, the wind was actually blowing and it was actually sprinkling. And I found that when the wind blew the paper over and the parts that had raindrops on them, when they touched um, other parts of the paper that had um, ink, it actually sucked up the ink and then I could actually print with the raindrops. It was quite incredible. So this, what I love is how like nature will actually reveal things to you um, if you're open to them. I, that, that's, I think, one of my major learnings <laughs> in, in this year is like just to really be open to, to um, how nature can actually be like a collaborator in, in your artistic processes. So I had attempted to do this outside and it wasn't, it, it wasn't um, feasible because trying to apply a whole bunch of ink onto paper but then trying not to get it onto the rocks was really hard. So I ended up thinking, okay, well, I'm working with cycles of water and I'm working with cycles of rain. Um, so I just, I need to um, A, take every opportunity of rain that occurs. And what happened that evening was a massive downpour <laughs> that started and I, and I thought, I, I just need to do this <laughs> the same day. I actually need to, um, I, I, I'm in the zone. <laughs> so like I had, I had spent six hours like grinding ink um, to get the amount of ink I needed. And, um, and it was close to midnight and I just applied a whole heap of ink onto um, paper and I made it so that I could actually physically handle it. And I actually had to have um, my partner help me because um, it was as wide as I, my arms could reach. It was as wide as our coffee table. But because of that amount of ink that I had applied, we, I actually needed another set of hands. So I would carry that first piece of paper out into the rain um, on, my, on my veranda and have it catch the raindrops, bring it back in. I would take another piece of paper out to the veranda, have rainfall on that. And then my partner and I would then gently place this onto the inked paper. Um, to create, to uh, um, have that sort of printing effect occur.